group behaviour is um, one of the uh, interesting topics in the world of psychology um, and in fact there was a time a hundred years ago when um, a lot of psychology um, and by um, association organizational behavior which is very closely aligned with it was focused very much on individuals and individual performance the last 50 60 years um, perhaps a little bit longer than that but about that period has seen a, a array of um, very powerful experiments that demonstrated that for example what happened in Nazi Germany um, where suddenly a very civilized race of um, well-respected world citizens suddenly seem to collectively lose their mind and behave in extremely bad ways that the world is unlikely to forget uh, and we're talking of course about Germany but also um, other countries in that period where individuals and in, in this eventually in Vietnam we saw similar incidents involving um, uh, American soldiers and we've of course even seen cases of, of Australians involved with atrocious behaviour that has been put down to the power of the group over the individual. So we've seen this revolution uh, and this revolution has shifted into the world of business as well in very interesting ways which we'll have a look at this week. Now Teams is a kind of like the format in which this topic gets discussed more often than not in organisational behaviour, particularly in the last decade or two where the word team has become awfully trendy uh, and has sort of been laid down as a template uh, over group behaviour in a more broad sense. Um, everything's so teamwork and there's always teams and self-directed teams, but really in effect what teams are are groups of two or more individuals that interact and are interdependent. Now interdependence is the key word here. Um, if you've got two people that are not interdependent, that is dependent on each other, then it's more, more the domain of power and leadership, uh, which we'll be talking about next week rather than teams. But teams we're looking at people on roughly the same level who are interact and interdependent and come together for a particular job or purpose, excuse me, and perceive themselves as a social group. They perceive themselves as a cluster. Now we get formal, um, formal and informal teams and that includes you know, departmental teams um, such as the design department for example or the uh, creativity department, um, production or service teams you know we're focused on particular servicing of particular photocopiers for example, um, leadership teams, self-directed teams we'll be talking a bit about that, advisory teams um, virtual teams is a very trendy uh, new area within the world of teamwork. Um, CQU, for example, is spread over many different campuses along the East Coast mainly. And um, I have to uh, manage staff in many different locations, people who I've never met before and only interact with by email or um, by video or by a form of Skype uh, or by telephone. Uh, and we work more or less cohesively as a group without that kind of physical interaction that traditionally is associated with group work or teamwork. It's of course very dependent on, um, on the world of technology. Community of practice is um, a kind of team that's overlaid over other teams where a group of people get together because of common interests or common tasks within an organisation to share tips and skills. And task force, which we'll talk about in a minute, or project teams. Now, perhaps the best of these project team styles is um, mentioned briefly in the textbook. It's worth focusing on briefly. Skunkworks. Um, have a look in Wikipedia <laughs> or something similar because you'll get a very nice series of stories about great uh, projects that have been achieved by skunkwork teams. Um, skunkworks is a, um, a, a team name that was given to a division of Lockheed Martin, the um, American aircraft manufacturer that was involved with the building of the U-2, which yes, did give its name to the uh, Irish pop band, but the U-2 before the, um, Bono and Co made it famous, was famous for producing uh, planes that flew so high in the stratosphere that um, they couldn't be shot down by Russian missiles and were able to fly above Russian territory and photograph and spy effectively on Russia. Um, caused um, 
many uh, serious diplomatic incidents between the two countries. The U-2 was a, a product of Skunk Work division of Lockheed Martin, um, but it was actually the Skunk Works were formed during World War II. And what's the key characteristic here of Skunk Work divisions is that they operate almost like organisations within organisations. They have um, almost like their own business management and their own life and their own direction without too much direction from the mothership, so to speak. Um, you know, enough of that. It's a minor area, but informal teams are equally important within organisations and they're basically teams that are formed um, within organisations but not by organisations or necessarily for organisations. They're formed for the members of those informal intra-organisation teams. And they exist because we love to get together with other people. We're social beings, more or less, and we love to gather in groups. And they help us form our identity and they are a source of emotional support. And it helps reduce stress at work and increase social capital, which I'll talk about in a moment. But just to focus briefly on this emotional support and reduction of stress aspect, men in particular, when they retire, experience commonly a great dip in their psychological health. And the reason for this dip is not because they miss work that much, but because they miss the social elements that work brings them. Uh, for men who have devoted themselves to work, their social life is their work. Uh, they haven't maintained friendships and, uh, and connections with the, the community beyond work. And so the loss of work becomes the loss of an enormous amount of social capital and social networks. Social capital, relatively new term once again, and it refers to the knowledge and resources available to people as a result of being in a network with others. Um, and it actually does produce real capital. So if you think about things like Rotary or Rotaract or Young Rotary uh, or the Lions groups in Australia, these are groups of often peers from different businesses who gather together partly for the social fun of it um, and partly for altruistic purposes, but also to gain in social capital from having friendly links with other businesses that they can trust and know. And this group um, network, which is purely social, can give rise to real advantages, real preferential treatment, almost like cartels, you could say. Now, the positives and negatives of teams. Now, naturally enough, um, Teams can produce, as we implied a few weeks back, so a, a phenomenon called social loafing. Now social loafing, you might refer, I talked about tug-of-war teams, um, where if you add an additional person to a tug-of-war team, that doesn't mean your tug-of-war team will increase by the strength of that person. Having larger groups tends to reduce the individual performance of individuals. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive because we all think of the power of the team, but social loafing is a well-recognised, well-tested phenomenon. And individuals tend to be better and faster and more creative on some kinds of tasks. We'll look at that in a moment. But teams also have what we call process losses, which is the energy and time wasted on team development, if you can use the word wasted, and team maintenance rather than on the task itself. On the positive side, teams often make richer, better informed decisions because of the diversity that comes from being in a team. A team is not just one mind, but many minds, and many different minds. And so the greater diversity that you can have within teams sometimes can help you digest decision-making uh, processes better. And it results in better information sharing, naturally enough, increased motivation and engagement, which is kind of um, counter to this issue of social loafing I referred to before. But you've got to remember social loafing refers to the output of the individual working alone versus the output of the individual working in a team. A team can nevertheless have net increases in motivation and engagement, but perhaps when you divide it into, if it's a team of five, and you divide it into five, it may not be a great advantage, but nevertheless can um, act as an advantage net to a company. And of course, this um, the appearance of teams does help fulfill that social drive that individuals have and also lead to a greater auditing of individuals. 
and team members act as comparators or um, benchmarks against which you can measure your own performance. Uh, if you're acting alone in a room on your own, you have no idea how you're doing. And that can be a very motivating effect. Um, just quickly, the textbook refers to Brooks' Law, which is a form of the social loafing law, and uh, it comes from a discussion of Apple's Aperture project where it started to run late and they added more people to the team and it still ran late and they had more people to the team and it grew by 130 engineers from a starting point of 20 and still arrived late. And it basically says somewhat ironically that the more people you add to the team, the more you slow progress down. It's a very negative view of the teams, but you can reduce social loafing impacts and you can reduce this impact of Brooks Law by ensuring that you do a number of things, which includes ensure that individual performance isn't hidden beneath the structure of the team, so that individuals still have a urge to perform and compete because they're not being buried under uh, this bland, mediocre level of the rest of the team. Smaller teams tend to have less social loafing as well. Teams that have a specified, specialised task tend to perform better and sh exhibit lower levels of um, social loafing. And you should also um, select motivated employees, self-motivated employees. Now, there is, um, this is one of those things, uh, five C's of team member competencies that are useful. I don't find it particularly useful, so I'll just dawdle on the screen a moment and move on. Team effectiveness model, somewhat more interesting. Basically, it's got two components uh, and a couple of contingency things. So if we just fill in the arrows here. Um, team effectiveness is this kind of global, remember I talked in the very first lecture, I think about organizational effectiveness. This is a variant of that kind of outcome. It's not about profit necessarily, but it's about a global measurement of effectiveness. It can include things like safety and creativity. Um, you can hardly be a, a good team if you're continually having accidents and people are dying on you, for example. So it's, 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 a, it's a global term that captures a lot of things that we find important within organisations. And we'll focus in on some of these contingencies that help explain why teams are effective or why they're not effective. First of all, with team design, team characteristics, task characteristics, sorry. So teams are good when tasks are sufficiently complex that they can't be done by one person. Um, and when the task requires an interdependence between individuals and when tasks are well structured. The issue of team size, there's quite a lot of research done on this. Um, you know, we, we, evolutionary psychologists are the people who look into things like, you know, how we uh, progressed from the stage of apes through, you know, um, neanderthals through to where we are. And on the basis of these studies, it's discovered that, you know, our social nature is such that we tend to work well in groups of around five to seven, much more than that, and it starts to become less functional probably for reasons of social loafing, but also because we can no longer personally identify as much with the people in our team. Small teams have less process loss, they feel more engaged with social loafing. Now the issue of team design, I've sort of implied already that diverse teams tend to be better performed teams because they bring, each individual brings an, a different kind of schema or mental model to a uh, a problem, let's say, or a project. They have bring different s skills, which are different to the mental models. The mental models are, are a more abstract level. The skills are more practical. They're more representative also of the real world out there, which you're after all producing the product or service for. So they bring a better understanding of the client by implication. But diverse teams tend to perform worse under some circumstances because they take longer to reach consensus. They're more susceptible to splitting up along these fault lines as the textbook refers to. Um, you know, the women tend to work together better and the men work together and you'll get uh, wastage caused by diverse teams splitting up into these natural, if you like, groups. Homogeneous teams also tend to be, not surprisingly, um, more cohesive 
and have greater job satisfaction on a group level. That doesn't mean that they have that kind of um, advantage that diverse teams can bring. When we talk about this issue of interdependence, we've got three types of interdependence we're talking about. Task interdependence, pooled, inter sorry, pooled interdependence, reciprocal interdependence, and sequential interdependence. We'll quickly look at these. E refers to employer, by the way. And, or employee, I'm sorry, employee, by the way. So pooled interdependence is where a group of employees all depend on, let's say, a central server computer. They all depend on a resource. So that's a form of interdependence. Reciprocal interdependence refers to where everybody depends on everybody else for something, effectively. And sequential independence refers to cases where you can't do something until someone else has done something before you. You'll often see this kind of interdependence on a manufacturing um, lines, you know, where on conveyor belt type um, systems where someone else has to put the axle on before you could start putting the wheel on, for example. Okay. So, issue of diversity, group diversity, as I said, it takes longer to get them up to speed, causes greater conflict, lowers morale. I've covered this pretty well. And Okay, the stages of team development. I think this slide is slightly faulty. Let's see how it progresses. Um, hmm. Yeah, we've got a bit of a problem here. Okay, so I don't know why this has disappeared, but I happen to know this um, what the slides are meant to show. So we'll go back. Stages of team development include uh, just from memory, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. So it starts off with forming, where uh, the organization, the, the team forms, and at this early stage, there's little agreement, there's a testering of boundaries, there's kind of jockeying for the position, unclear purpose, and there's a requirement for someone to step in and give guidance and direction and individuals within the group are kind of working out is it worthwhile belonging to this group then at the storming stage um, very quickly after that initial forming stage has, has taken place you get this greater degree of conflict um, which is followed very quickly by um, people taking coaching roles and clarity beginning to crystallize. There's of course competition at this stage and people attempting to imprint their view onto the group or the team. And the norming stage is where these norms tend to crystallize and consensus and roles get clarified, etc. It's starting to get to more towards what looks like a team at this stage. That's the norming stage. You're just going to picture these words in the background here. I don't know why they disappear. Uh, and then there's the performing stage where all things are going well. The vision clarifies, the goal is focused, the tasks have been delegated, blah, blah, blah. Everything's happening well. And then at a final stage, because they couldn't think of another word that ended with orming, they went with adjourning, which sounds not very good rhyme, to be honest but it's about the possibility that the team comes to an end, that the team has a finite life, and at that stage, hopefully, you'll have this kind of debrief process where um, you know, achievements are recognized and people have a, a party and um, generally pat each other on the back and uh, talk about how things went and lessons that can be learned. But like all meat theories, um, you know, these stage theories, aren't always matched by reality. The process isn't always that linear. The stages tend to overlap, like the forming and the norming and the storming and the performing. They tend to all overlap, and stages tend to be skipped uh, so that you can go straight from, for example, the forming stage to the performing stage without going th through the conflict stage that's called storming. And groups can also go backwards, and conflict can, for example, appear after you've reached the performing stage. For example, a new member joins. And remember that conflict, um, which is implied as something that's in the past, in an early stage of this team development, 
Um, it implies it's a bad thing, but that is not, as we'll see in future weeks, always the case. Now, um, I wouldn't mind if you went onto YouTube and uh, Googled, if you wish, um, things like the Stanley, uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment, which is this video here, uh, or the um, Milgram Compliance Experience Experiment. Um, they're probably a very good couple of experiments that you could have a look at. Quite shocking um, in how uh, they played out with humans and how humans, even in posh uh, California, where it was very much white, very much not Nazi Germany, because this, this is the ones I was talking about earlier, where people had assumed there must be something wrong, something diseased about the Germans, that they could have done what they did to the Jews. But um, as these experiments showed, you could get ordinary Americans straight off the street, without not even put them under an enormous amount of pressure, and suddenly they start doing things that don't quite add up with our view of how we civilized people are. So one of the things that that particular um, the prison experiment showed was the power of roles. In this case, the power of not that kind of roles, but that kind of roles. The power of um, the prison guard role versus the prisoner role. A particularly powerful experiment showing that once we find ourselves in a role, we start to behave in ways that that role kind of expects us to perform. Now roles can be either formally assigned or informally um, and this tends to happen during early team development and often is related to personal skills and characteristics. Now negative norms can also um, begin to happen and I um, I don't know why I've popped that there, but, you know, as, as I said in relation to the prison experiment, um, if there are elements of norms that are somewhat um, regressive or, or counterproductive, they can still impact on the individual. And sometimes these, these negative norms can emerge almost spontaneously with an organisation, perhaps through gossip or uh, organisational politics. And if that happens, you really need as a manager to intervene at, at as early stage as possible. But in order to intervene, you really need to be um, clued in to what's happening within your organisation. One of the reasons why communication uh, between management and lower level staff is so key. Um, just this issue of team, um, team cohesiveness, uh, obviously cohesive teams in many ways will perform better um, and some of the factors that help you to improve the cohesiveness so that teams act more like teams is a little bit like some of the, the factors that assist in ensuring performance in itself and not uh, and getting away from that social loafing issue that we talked before so for example once again we need smaller groups to improve cohesiveness we need to make sure that there's clear goals and that the group can identify with those goals. Um, if you have a group that spends more time together, it will cohere, that's a real word by the way, it will cohere better than groups that only get together very relatively rarely. So for example, we recently had a retreat where we as a business school got together for a couple of days and I think that definitely did improve our identity as a team and our degree of sense of cohesiveness. Um, you can increase group status and hurdles to entry, that always works. So for example, nurses these days feel more like nurses and they feel more like th when they put on the uniform and get together, they feel a sense of group to a greater degree because it's harder to become a nurse now than it was a hundred years ago, for example. Setting up an opposition with the other, so stimulate competition with other groups, um, tend to give group rather than individual rewards. So if you give individual rewards, you're naturally going to set people up against each other. Can still be a good thing to do, by the way, because remember you're wanting to avoid social loafing. Isolate the group, put it in one geographical location. That will, of course, mean that they'll spend more time together and that they will gain a greater sense of group status or group identity. 
And of course, having lower diversity helps to increase um, cohesiveness. So we've got this issue of norms, um, which is very closely associated with roles, but norms are informed rules and shared expectations that groups establish to regulate behaviour of members. Um, groups establish and police these norms by a number of different means. It's not all through um, direct feedback. So, for example, no one told me at CQ, oh, Olaf, you need to dress well, you're in a business school, and you need to wear long pants to work and um, black shoes. It's just something that um, I did as a matter of expectations about my role here at CQU and also watching what other staff did which is a process that's called modelling what other staff were wearing and I followed that um, that norm but sometimes there can be this process of um, direct feedback is required as well and conformity um, I don't think I've played this video for you before but I will I'm just checking that you can still hear me you can. I can't hear the I can't hear the video by the way, so I'll just talk over the top of it. This is a group of this is a typical social psych experiment. So this is a little taste of what I'm talking about. These people are all stooges, as in they're all actors, and they all face the back of the wall of the lift. This guy's a real person, he's got in the left and there's a candid camera in the room and he's feeling very uncomfortable about the fact he's the odd man out, literally. And so he begins to turn and he pretends that um, he's not conforming by looking at his watch and sort of gives him the excuse to move a little bit further. He's turning to the back and so on and so forth. People do conform you can get simply by getting a group of people to behave in a certain way you can get individuals to shift towards that um, group norm but it has been noticed that in the last decades the conformity effect which is a striking incredibly well replicated uh, finding of social psychology the conformity effect has weakened in the last few decades but as i said we're still turning up for work as guys looking fairly homogenous. Girls, a little bit less so, it's true. I'm not saying that girls have less um, uh, conformity, I'm saying that girls conform less on clothing because the norm for female clothing is a greater deal of display um, and variety is more important. I don't think girls are expected to all turn up wearing the same kind of clothing every day or the same kind of clothing as everybody else. Okay, issue of trust. We actually need to spin through this because we're up to the 28 minutes mark and I've got a fair bit to go. So you've got different kinds of trust. Identification based trust which is kind of the best form of trust. It involves where you feel an emotional, social uh, link or identity link with the team based on some common values. Knowledge based trust is based on the fact that you know from experience that people around you are to be trusted. And then there's calculus based trust which is the worst kind of trust. Um, it's based on deterrence or laws or threat of reprisal or punishment and that kind of thing. Self-directed teams, we talked a little bit about that before but these are cross-functional work groups organised around a particular work process that focus on a single piece of work and those self-directed teams, as you can guess from the name, have a fair bit of autonomy. They're responsible for a particular job and they have a high degree of interdependence, they have a low degree of interdependence with other teams, they have a lot of autonomy um, and they include things like, you know, um, support teams or communication teams or coordination teams. Multicultural teams, similarly, they can be obviously affected by cultural differences um, and they're based on a number of different kinds of um, values. Um, <sighs> 
talked previously in previous weeks about um, the difficulties, the difficulties of just assuming that people from different cultural backgrounds all have the same kind of values or the same kind of assumptions about power distance uh, or the same kind of perspectives. And so naturally enough, forming multicultural teams or multinational multicultural teams can be extremely challenging for the manager. How to build a real team, a team that acts like a team, a team that feels like a team, out of these multicultural uh, diversity is quite a challenge. Similarly, virtual teams offer a significant challenge. They're becoming increasingly common as a result of uh, workplace globalization. Uh, technological advances, of course, facilitated that. Um, the characteristics of these teams tend to be very tech savvy. They tend to have or need or require quite a bit of self-leadership skills, a fair bit of emotional intelligence so that you can work out on the basis of scant evidence what other people are thinking, what other people's skills or values are that they can bring to a team. And they tend to be, um, these three characteristics tend to be associated with the success of these virtual teams. In order to work, virtual teams need people who've got these three types of things. They also need plenty of structure and they need to have a variety of different means of communication and the members of the virtual teams really need to have the right to choose which mediums they want to use at a particular time. It's also very valuable to get these teams meeting face to face early on in the gestation of a team uh, or the birth of a team. Okay, group decision making. As I said, um, we've got these issues. Um, it's a good little topic here, but uh, we are desperately short of time. But group decision making tends to be slower. There's the risk of conformity. Individuals can dominate these conversations and uh, tend to shift uh, decisions into a particular direction. With groups, there can be this diffusion of responsibility, the kind of like um, social loafing in decision making is quite dangerous and there's also this sense will I speak up will I be evaluated for what I say on the positive side they're more thorough and they offer these greater uh, de creativity and greater diversity of views plus when a group makes a decision even if it's kind of fake the deceit, the, there is a degree to which well you are at the meeting you agreed to it so surely you've got to go along with this now. You took part in the decision making process. So it does increase acceptance of outcomes even if you're being a little bit cynical. Group shift and group think are two common risks of uh, group decision making. So group think is where people, uh, so it's the individual's ability to think clearly inside a group even on issues of quite import such as ethical or moral issues. Um, is reduced by acting in a team to some degree. It's this social loafing effect. Groupthink also um, relates more to surface level um, unanimate, unanimous thinking uh, or conformity. It's rather than a deep level change is going on. So what you get within a group is people looking like they all agree with a decision even if they don't. And a group shift is an interesting phenomenon. The textbook doesn't really talk about this, but it's kind of, this is the conservative shift. Group shift is the risky shift, where someone speaks up, makes a good case, he doesn't even really believe in it, or she doesn't really believe in it, but everyone thinks, wow, that's well put, and they shift from a position that they were into a riskier, more radical spot than they ever would have done had they not been exposed to that group setting. So those are two kind of contradictory um, effects. Now, you can stop these kinds of uh, problem thinking within groups by encouraging critical thinking, actually begging for it from the team. Um, so reward counter thinking, reward um, devil's advocates, for example. You can increase team diversity, obviously reduce team size, as we've all well become familiar with make sure that no one's dominating the conversation and engage in some of these other techniques such as brainstorming, uh, nominal group technique or electronic meetings. Now all of these techniques, textbook does talk about them, but all three of these techniques involve 
turning a team into an anti-team, turning a team into a group of individuals. So, for example, the nominal group technique um, stops people from interacting. They may be physically all present, but they have to operate independently, for example, by um, you know, voting on something in private or coming up with ideas and writing them down and then sharing them. Uh, so these are the techniques that you can use uh, to stop the uh, team dynamic from uh, distorting decision making. Okay, communications, the second part, the second chapter, which is the reason why we're running late. I suddenly didn't realise that. We'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, so communication, you're, you're also, I'm aware, a lot of you are actually doing a lot of this material in other courses, so we'll skate over this. But communication, good, good communication is important with an organisation, has a very strong function within the organisation. It helps coordinate groups, it helps groups learn, it helps them create quality decisions, it helps them engage in the process of change, and it improves a sense of well-being through that um, sense of social connection that you can form. So lying, uh, I'll, this is something I just, if you like, have a look at this um, story on BBC. It's, it's a current story, uh, How to Catch a Liar at the Office, and it's um, reports on some CIA techniques of picking liars. Quite fascinating. I won't go into it now. So, one of the important things to talk about in, the, in relation to communication, and we talked about it briefly in the form of uh, when we talked about teams before, is, uh, is the internet. It has revolutionised the way we do business. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you this way, and you wouldn't be listening to me if it wasn't for this modern technology and the way things have developed in the last you know, 20, 30 years. When I was young, I'm sufficiently old to be able to say that when I was young, there was no email, there was no internet, there was no VoIP, Skype, uh, Snapchat, uh, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Um, now, it's sometimes forgotten that the purpose of the internet was to ensure the delivery of very precise commands and very precise information, absolutely accurate information. It was developed by the US military with that in mind. It was also designed with this top-down thinking involved where the general issued an order and there was no back chat. Now that's of course changed a lot. One of the negatives of, of um, internet has become clear over time. Some of the negatives are poor at delivering emotions. It reduces politeness and respect in communication so we get all these people um, spamming and flaming and uh, bullying each other on the net. It's good for clear, crystal clear ideas. It's poor at nuanced or grey area communication. It's too easy to communicate too much on the internet. I mean, think of the cases with Facebook where you put up something and before you know it, everybody knows you're engaged or everybody knows you had a fight or everybody knows you had a bad plastic surgery or whatever. Um, and more importantly, in a work setting, uh, your boss knows. <coughs> now, I would love you to have a look at this video. I'll see if it comes up very quickly. Um, it's John Cusack. Um, and see if you can find this one on the net. John Cusack, um, Body Language, I think will get it for you. And you'll notice that John Cusack is a professional actor and he's attempting to hide um, his f true feelings, but despite him being a professional actor, he's exhibiting all sorts of emotions, including looking at the woman's breasts, uh, a sense of um, you know, surprise or insult. Um, you know, he's leaking information despite the fact he's trying not to leak information. It's a fascinating video. Now, this issue of channel, we're going to talk about it very quickly in a moment, but this issue of channel choice, the way you deliver information, is a key component. Now, we talked about the internet and how it's good for, for example, accurate, um, simple, clear ideas and poor for um, nuanced, polite, 
uh, interactive ideas at times. I mean, the, the net has improved a lot, but it still has problems in these areas. So communication channel depends on how well the channel is approved by the organisation, uh, by the regulations within the organisation or the team. Now, just for example, um, you know, the memo or the white paper may be considered the appropriate way to uh, deliver some information in a certain context, and a sticky note might be a very poor, um, respected method of communication. But the other question is, how much information do you want to get across, and how grey is it? Um, so, you know, for example, I'm communicating to you with what we call a, a rich media, a multi-channel communication means. I'm waving my hands here in the corner if you can see me. Um, I'm speaking to you, my voice, you can see my face, plus you can see this material, this written material in front of you. So this is actually a good example of quite a rich um, communication channel. It allows me to deliver multiple cues, it uh, allows me to provide rapid and timely information to you. Um, rich media channels are typically like face-to-face -face ones are very easily customizable. If we were facing each other now, I could watch if you understood what I was saying and slightly alter my voice or tone or spend more time on a particular issue. So face-to-face -face is the ultimate in richness and highly rich channels uh, allow complex, um, customizable, ambiguous, complex, non-routine data to be delivered effectively. I think that's pretty, that stuff is pretty um, negative, uh, well, I was going to say negative, pretty redundant. So in improving communication, um, it's important that you use multiple channels in delivering uh, information from a to B. It's important that if that you check that the message has been received and customize or alter the message if you feel it hasn't been received. Instead of just delivering bland, um, skeletal or skeleton-like um, information, try and be descriptive and give examples and make sure that you use timing. Uh, there's fascinating studies, by the way, on um, people talking in crowds showing that we have an enormously complex and subtle understanding of when crowd noise is about to dip, so that when we're talking at a, at, you know, a party or whatever, we're able to choose the right moment in which to say things, just at the moment that the, that the ebb and flow of the conversation dips a little bit, and we're uh, fascinating research showing that we're much more in tune with what's going on around us, even when we're trying to block it out, than what we think we are. These issues of empathy and active listening, uh, I'll just very briefly emphasise this because it's a fascinating area. If you think that listening involves me saying something to you and you saying, um, let's say for example I would say to you, uh, look, um, uh, I've had a really big week, um, of course being true, it's true actually, and um, I'm finding it hard to concentrate, but uh, you know, this is the only time of day when I can really record these videos because you know, this is the only time of day when this vast office that I'm sitting in is empty enough for me to be able to record me speaking out loud without annoying other people. Imagine I were to say that to you. Now, the active listening response to that would be, ah, all of so, um, you know, you're struggling, you've had a bit of a hard week, and um, you're struggling to find the right time at which you can do certain tasks like recording videos. That would be active listening. It would show that you'd heard what I'd said. Whereas characteristically, when people talk, let's, when, let's say when people say, um, you, you'll hear people on a train talking, for example, and one of them will say, yeah, I've got a bit of a headache. Now, very commonly, and we're all guilty of this, the other person will say, oh yeah, I've got a bit of a backache and think that that's showing them they're listening. Now they are listening, they did hear the person's got a headache, but they have immediately related it to themselves. That ability to empathise with the other person and reflect that what they've said is an extraordinarily powerful form of communication. And as a manager, you could really do 
worse than to learn that technique, reflect back what the person just said to you, check that that is what they meant, if, even if it means repeating the message, and making sure that the, the, that you, the communication you're engaging in is real as opposed to surface level communication. Now, studies obviously show that this face-to-face -face medium is the most powerful for these reasons. It's got that media richness. It allows us to be emotional and flexible and send more than one signal at once, to be very firm and directive, but at the same time sympathetic and um, concerned. It allows us to gather instant feedback. And it's high in social presence, like I can use my charisma on you, uh, if I'm in your presence to a greater degree than if I'm just a video recording. The textbook does talk about the grapevine and uh, the power of gossip within an organisation. It tends to take control of an organisation in information terms when no other formal channel uh, is doing its job properly. And it's often delivering to your staff members misinformation. Now gossip forms a social function and that it helps relieve anxiety, but when gossip is wrong, it can create anxiety. It helps glue a team together. Part of the function of communication, and if you want to look up the term, look up the term phatic communication, it's spelled P-H-A-T-I-C. Uh, phatic communication is just the social function of communication, not delivering information at all, but just showing that we're chatting, you know, showing that we're there. It, so communication and gossip, misinformation, and the grapevine, which is the delivery system of gossip, helps to bond people together. Because information is power. Information is something that someone else doesn't have. When formal communication breaks down, as I said, the grapevine tends to take over and when there's too much gossip going on and there's too much grapevine delivery of information, it's often a bad thing for the organisation. Because grapevines are acting as competitors to formal communication. The management needs to monitor it, and if it's wrong, rectify it. And that's it, and I better press done quickly.